Um, I'm going to start the talk with an extraordinary image of an eye. This is what we call a compound eye. They have multiple different tiny eyes together, rather that you might see in bees or arthropods today. And you can see that this is indeed an arthropod, segmented. It's a trilobite. And this trilobite lived in the sand. And it just poked its eyes out above the sand to see what was coming along. And throughout this lecture, I'm going to try and show you the remarkable diversity of eyes that have come about um, and how that might have happened. So there are many types of eyes. And eyes are present perhaps in 95% of all animal species, which implies that eyes and vision are really, really important and must have a survival advantage uh, in various environments. The question is, did eyes arise once, and therefore they're all descended from a single eye, or did eyes evolve many times, or were they made many times? For example, octopuses and humans superficially have very similar eye designs. This is a squid eye, this is a human eye, and they look very, very similar. And they're both camera eyes. In fact, jellyfish also can develop a camera eye, and here's the iris, here's the lens, and also fish. Now, these evolve in a completely different way from a completely different ancestors using completely different tissues to come to the same solution, which is a camera eye that is useful for those animals to survive in their environments. Rather similar that if you want to be an animal that lives in water, you want to be shaped like a torpedo. So you could be related to a whale, like a dolphin, which is a mammal. You could be a reptile. And here is an ophthalmosaurus, one of the ichthyosaur groups. Or you could be a fish. Or in fact, even indeed a whale, another mammal. And all of these shapes are the same. But quite clearly, they've come from very, very different ancestry. And this is called convergence. So the question that is being asked now, were these shapes, or indeed the eye, which is a complex organ, were they miraculously designed? Or is there any evidence that gradual evolution could have led to these amazing complex organs. The Evo Devo versus God argument. Now, on what basis should I be talking this? Because I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I'm not a molecular biologist. However, I have done quite a lot of work in cell signaling in the past, and I spend my life looking at eyes, and particularly damaged eyes, and trying to work out ways that we can repair them. This is a multidisciplinary area, and someone who is an expert in ops and evolution may not necessarily be the best person perhaps to talk on the shape of eyes or aspheric aberrations or how the corneas may have developed in different species over the years. I'm also not an expert in God, but I would like to say that those who are should be rather afraid because I bet she's rather angry about what happened last night. <laughs> William Paley was the senior wrangler at Christ College, Cambridge, and lectures on moral philosophy. Interestingly, he was a supporter of the American colonialists because he was anti-slavery. And Samuel Johnson was against the American colonialists because he was also anti-slavery, which meant that there was obviously a schism occurring in the American colonies at that time prior to their independence from the British Empire. He wrote a book in 1785, The Principles of Moral and Political Philosophy, um, which was actually studied by Darwin uh, a couple of generations later when he was a student. Natural theology tries to explain that the evidence using daily things that are around us to explain God. And one of the arguments used, it's actually a very old argument, it was used previously in ancient history as well, it says that if we're walking along the heath and we find a watch, then it must be inevitable that watch must have had a maker unlike, for example, a stone, which we might not imagine might have had a maker. And therefore, there must have existed at some time and in some place or other an artificer or artificers who formed it for the purpose with which we find it actually to do. Now, there were many arguments um, suggesting that there may be other explanations for finding complex things on the heath. And really going back to Erasmus um, Darwin, who um, had formulated already that there may be a process of evolution. James Hutton also, we'll talk about him a little bit later. Lamarck had his own theory about how 
complex characteristics might arise through generations and um, was subsequently disproven by the um, uh, genetic variation, but actually there are some Lamarckian traits that still um, need to be explained. William Herbert, um, Deloy, um, Charles Southwell and William Chilton, or Chilton, all of whom put in um, theories of evolution, not particularly well developed and, and they did vary in their sophistication. And perhaps the most important one was Alfred Russell Wallace on the law which regulated the introduction of new species. And this is the paper that was sent to Darwin that stimulated Darwin to publish his previous unpublished papers, which were presented at the Linnaean Society in that uh, very famous um, talk. Um, interesting, without the permission of Wallace and in the absence of Darwin. Now, there are many sources for those of you who want to read further on this. There's the evolution of phototransaction, the eyes, philosophical transactions. There's a dozen papers in here which are excellent, beautifully written, and, and are accessible to the non-specialist. Ned Freeman, professor of uh, evolutionary biology at Harvard, excellent on plant evolution, but generally is a very good writer and um, very accessible. Wikipedia has been used as a source for many of the photographs that I didn't have time to get permission to go to the National History Museum to take for myself. Um, a wonderful book, Evolutions Witnessed by Ivan Schwab, who also wrote a series of articles over the last 20 years in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. Animalized by Michael Land and Eric Nilsson, is now in its second edition. A little bit more turgid, but for those of you who have a particular interest, I cannot recommend this book too highly. Um, finally, um, Marcel, who kindly took me on long rambles and explained to me the nature of geology, and my father, Rowan Bailiff, who first introduced me to evolution and to the multiple types of animals and plants that are around us and how they may have developed. Now, Thomas Malthus started this off with his essay on the principles of population, which suggested that if there was no break on populations, there would be a lack of a food supply and various problems associated with that, including mass starvation. So three doctors took this on board. Um, one was William Wells, who was a colonial-born military surgeon. He had to put his affairs in order in North Carolina fairly smartly and leave before he was tired and feathered, and came back to Britain, where he then went to work as an officer in the army in Holland. Quite a colorful chap, ended up threatening his boss with a duel. Um, didn't actually happen, but he wrote this wonderful essay which was published after his um, death, which was the differences in colour and form between the white and negro races. And what he proposed was that dark people can live in certain environments because they carry an immunity from tropical diseases, which, as uh, Frank, the former professor, will tell you, is actually quite true and does form a selective pressure. However, this is really only applying to humans and isn't general to other species, but certainly it was the first really sound inkling of natural selection, which Darwin himself recognises later. James Pritchard also spoke about the dividing of human species and how that may have occurred. And Sir William Lawrence, a bart surgeon and ophthalmologist and a medical reformer, he helped publish The Lancet at the time when it was a rather uh, dangerous um, organ for the... Um, government, he was forced to withdraw his book after fierce criticism by the Lord Chancellor who ruled it blasphemous. And interestingly, the Court of Chancery in those days not only sat on matters of chancery, it also sat on matters of blasphemy. And that wasn't reformed till um, the 19th century. And a very important person you'll come across is Patrick Matthews, a Scottish landowner and fruit grower who um, complained to Darwin that Darwin had failed to recognise his great work on natural selection. He was talking about the evolution of timbers and how they might be grown to improve naval architecture at a very important time in Britain. Darwin actually responded in a letter to the Gardener's Chronicle saying, I've been much interested by Mr. Patrick Matthews' communication in the number of your paper, April 17th. I fully acknowledge that he has anticipated by many years the explanation which I've offered for the origin of species under the name of natural selection. I think that no one will feel surprised that neither I, nor apparently any other naturalist, had heard of Mr. Matthews' views, considering how briefly they're given and they appear in an appendix to a work on naval timber and arboriculture. I could do more than offer my sincere apologies to Mr. Matthews for my entire ignorance of his publication. Darwin himself 
had a very coherent theory of natural selection, although as we've seen, many of the people in this period were coming to this idea that this might be a better explanation of why there are so many different animals and plants out there, rather than actually having separate species individually plonked on earth by a watchmaker. And after many travels and many years of work, he published in his notebooks, but didn't actually put them into the general um, field until he was forced to do so by a letter from Alfred Russell Wallace, who, influenced by Darwin, went on a trip to the Latin American countries, but unfortunately his collection was entirely lost on the way home by ship fire, and they were actually in an open boat and lucky to be rescued themselves on a passing boat to Liverpool. Undisturbed by this, he sets off to Malay, collecting 125,660 specimens, including no more than 1,000 which were entirely new to science. He also realised that there was a line that divided the different groups of species, which to this day is called Wallace's line, and it marks the Australian fauna and flora from the Asiatic flora and fauna. On receiving this letter, Darwin was perplexed as to what to do because he realised that this was entirely his life's work that had been produced completely independently by someone who was currently residing on the other side of the world. So he asked the leading scientists of his day for advice, and that's why they decided that all the papers should be published together, including the 30-year-old data from Darwin's original voyage. However, Darwin did realise there was a problem with complex organs, particularly the eye. To suppose that the eye, with all its contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, I freely confess absurd in the highest degree. However, he does go on to say that I, however, can imagine that very, very small steps could lead to this. In a letter to Asa Gray, the American naturalist, he says, the eye to this day gives me a cold shudder, but when I think of the fine known gradation, my reason tells me I ought to conquer the odd shudder. And he proposed that the eye could well have evolved many times. Richard Dawkins, in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, describes an experiment that he did with a computer. It's often mentioned in public houses across the land that if you gave a monkey a typewriter, by the way, the last one was manufactured yesterday in Wales as it's closed down, so this may be a historical experiment, um, that if you gave him long enough, he would be able to publish the complete works of Shakespeare. However, let's make it simpler for the monkey. And what we'll do is we'll just give him one line, this line here, methinks it is like a weasel that is spoken by Hamlet when he is pretending he's going mad, describing some distant clouds as he's been summoned to his mother. If that monkey had to write that sentence and was given a typewriter, he would have 27 to the 28, or about 10 to the 40 possible combinations, which would take him about a million, 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 million years to actually do, which is about a million, million, million times longer than the universe has so far existed. So it seems unlikely that the typewriter would survive that bashing. However, if you do a computer program and you put a random error into the copying and the computer selects the output of the mutant that most likely represents this phrase, you can get there over a lunchtime. And in generation one, you have the random letters and spaces. Generation two, we've selected one mutation here. Generation 10, there are more mutations that have been selected. And very, very soon, we come to, methinks, it is like a weasel. And using this, Richard Dawkins was saying this is a model to explain how if we select for changes that are advantageous, we can end up with quite complex things a thousand, 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 thousand million years earlier than we would do if we waited to do it completely by chance. The analogy being that natural selection is the mechanism along with variation and genetic changes that allows for evolution. It's not a complete analogy, because remember, evolution doesn't start off with me thinks it's like a weasel, i.e. a human eye, and then you have some sort of archaean tadpole modelling around with a couple of photoreceptors and says, we're going to go from here to this. Evolution doesn't work like that. Um, and furthermore, it is well argued that Richard Dawkins' programme required 
a watchmaker who was Richard Dawkins to actually do it. But nevertheless, the, that is not the point that Dawkins was making. Dawkins was making the point that small random changes, single random changes that are selective are a mechanism for change. So how long using this model would it take to evolve an eye? <clears throat> well, Nielsen and Pelder in 94 did a calculation that if there was a 0.005% change in each generation, which is a minute change, and often changes are much larger than this, and if that change was selective to improving the visual function of an organism, and that organism needed that improvement because of the environment it was either living in was changing or it was trying to inhabit another environment, then it would take about 364,000 generations, which sounds like a lot, <clears throat> but it's the blink of an eye, if you'll excuse the phrase, in geological terms. If we have a patch of pink epithelium, but one of the pink epithelium cells actually has some receptors in it for light, this animal can respond to light. It knows where it's dark, it knows where it's light, it can move under um, boulders um, and various other behaviours. If, however, it starts to evolve a cup with some pigment around it here that shields it, it now can see direction of light and it knows where the light is coming from and it gives it a simple way of detecting direction of prey and early habitats and as we come up and form a pinhole camera we can get quite sophisticated vision from this and this is still used by some ancient cephalopods like Nautilus. These are still used by many animals in part uh, or sometimes in their development. And this is still used by many animals that only need to respond to light on the outside of their um, surface, on their epithelium. Taking this further, we get more sophistication if we fill in this open cup full of seawater with a gel. And we now start to get primitive focusing. And if we start to make that gel a little bit more condensed and into an organism that's called a lens, we can get very sophisticated um, focusing indeed, and then we can start to develop a rigid outer coat, and then we can come out of the water and have a camera-like eye, both in the water and out of the water. And this takes a very short time to do. So it's very, very plausible that if this model is correct, that the eye could have evolved from a very simple mutation in a cell on the surface of a simple organism. If this is going to happen, what we might want to look, like, look at is the, the tasks that might need to be undertaken by these organisms. So we could have a type 1 task, which I mentioned before, which is just really to monitor the ambient light. Is it day? Is it dark? And animals have different behaviours in the day and the dark. It has no direction at all. It's useful for circadian rhythm, avoidance of light, and shadow detection, very crude predator detection. If you've got a large shark coming over you, you might want to crawl up into your shell or under a rock somewhere. Also, it's useful for burrowers. It tells them when they're getting to the, the top of the burrow, when they need to go down again. No organ is required, so it's very difficult to identify these in fossil animals, and they need microscopes to identify them in living animals today. Class two are behaviours based on the direction of light, and these allow us to phototaxis. That means we can move towards the light, we can control our posture relative to light, and we can see the approach of predators. And this requires a few modifications. We need to stack the photoreceptors so that we've got a lot of surface area. We need to shield the photoreceptors with some pigment, either in a simple archaean photoreceptor itself or by adding in a separate cell. And then eventually we need to add a bunch of photoreceptors together in a little cup. And if we make that cup into a pinhole or duplicate it and make a multiple pinhole camera, which is done in many arthropods, we can get spatial resolute vision with a low resolution. But if we want high resolution, what we're going to do is to add in a focusing lens, which is a class 4 task. So I hope by these two last illustrations I've given you that we can have a big overall of what I'm going to talk about for the rest um, of this lecture. Now, Arendt's division of labour model of eye evolution is really rather interesting. We start off by having an ancient cell type that has to have at least three functions. One is light detection via a photoreceptive organelle, light shading, and movement direction via a locomotor cilia. And these are very important aspects of surviving as single-cell animals. 
Now, located around the circumference of zooplankton larvae, we actually do have these cells which can mediate phototaxis because what that's happening, phototaxis, the light, you're going towards the light, um, and what you're doing is linking these photoreceptors directly with cilia that can beat. And we're going to see some examples of that later on. Now, so the first thing to evolve, we need the biochemical mechanisms. We need these what are called serpentine proteins that go up and down in the cell membrane. They are used for lots of things. Before the site was ever thought about, these were used for detecting nasty substances. They were used for detecting hormones, and they were used for signaling between different animals. They're linked to a signaling molecule, and that signaling molecule leads to flow of um, material through pores, which can then affect how the cell behaves. These are more complex assemblies where we have the photoreceptor shielded by a pigment cell, and now we have a neuron that's going to connect this to, to other bits of the body that are going to react to the light, and we're starting to develop cells inside the eye, such as a hyalocyte or a vitreous cell, and later on lens cells and other structures, and eventually we're going to form a complex, sophisticated organ, and the shape of that organ that we're going to form will depend very much on the environment that we're living in. And there are many bow plans for what that shape might be. We've seen cup eyes before. We've seen multiple cup eyes. These are both the same, and these depend on shadow. We have this series of eyes, which depend on focusing. And then this series of eyes depend on reflection. All of these are used by animals um, to different animals to see. These eyes are simple eyes or chambered eyes because they're just involved in the chamber. And these eyes down here are compound eyes. And these are generally used by many arthropods and many invertebrates, although some invertebrates will develop camera eyes, as we said in the first slide, and uh, different types of chemicals and chemical reactions are used. So is this evidence that the eye evolved many times? Well, it, it might be, because there's so many different types of eyes. But then Goering and Clearing in Basel, who were looking at fruit fly transcription factors, identified a protein that binds to DNA. This is a feature of transcription factors, so they immediately sent it out to a worldwide computer database to see if there were any similar genes that had already been reported, and indeed there were. There was a mouse gene called Pax6, and there was a human gene called Aniridia, and there was a great deal of similarity between this new gene. And furthermore, identical genes were subsequently found in a whole bunch of different animals. Now, what this gene was, was very interesting. The location was on a chromosomal site that harboured mutations in flies with developmental eye defects. And if you turn, put this gene in artificially into a developing fly and you turned it on, the, eye, the animal would develop extra eyes. And sometimes it would direct extra eyes in funny places, like on its antennae or the end of its legs or on its wings. And these were fully functioning eyes. So the result of this was, it was realised that there was a master control gene that was developing eyes, and it didn't matter what sort of eye it was, whether it was a simple eye, like a human eye, or a compound eye, like um, an insect eye, this gene was the master controller that was making these embryonic larvae metamorphose, and to metamorphose and grow eyes where they shouldn't have been if any of these master control genes were present. And interestingly, these are very important genes associated with developmental defects. Now, long before animals were ever thought of, there were organisms living in the primeval soup. And these organisms diversified into bacteria and into another group of organisms called archaea. And they lived on Earth for a very, very long time. And from archaea, multi-complex cells developed with a single nucleus, still a single cell. And this branching tree of life was shown, as you can see here, in one of the pages of Darwin's notebook, although he wasn't relating it to ancient organisms. But what we're seeing, and what we're implying is, is that all life is coming from a common ancestor. We're implying that life may not have evolved many, many times, or at least current life may not have evolved 
many, many times. We have no data that goes back before the Hadean age because the Earth's crust, which had crystallized, was completely melted and subducted. It is possible that there may have been some form of life, but if we imagine how harsh the conditions were, it seems difficult to imagine that, they, that there would have been, but it is possible. So from this, we can start to imagine the evolution of animals. We have a single cell animal here, which then starts to clump together and starts to have a division of labor. And in fact, there is an animal like that, well, a, a, a group of cells together called Volvox. And then we have more sophisticated um, cells developing with more specialized um, functions. And these are what are called metazoans, so multicellular animals, and they go on to radiate into either sponges, which have no true tissues, and are called parazoans, or they come into eumetazoans, which are animals that do have specialized tissues. And these fall into two great groups. They fall into those that if you cut them down the middle, they have two roughly identical halves. And there are those, if you cut them down the middle, that you can cut them down many times, and they have what's called radial symmetry. And how these animals are put together in the embryonic stage is very different as well. But the great thing about bilateral symmetry is it enables you to have a front and a back, a head and a tail. And this is going to be really important in our story, talking about the development of eyes. A couple of things happen as well here. We start to develop tubes for digestion, and we can develop this as a pseudo-tube. Um, we can develop it as a proper body cavity, and if we do develop proper body cavities, we can then develop things like muscles, which we can make into hearts. We can move around our environment. We're not passively swayed by the tides, as animals that do not have true um, tissues can do. And eventually we come on and evolve chordates, and these go on to form us. Now, using DNA, that simple relatively simple a way of looking at evolution as has been slightly modified and this is the new um, it's not that different and I'm not going to go into it in too much detail except for to show there are some surprising outgroups like Xenotrebella that's a worm-like creature that's very simple that lives in the silt of Norwegian fields and turns out to be very closely related to us um, so not all deuterosomes are necessarily have backbones or vertebrates, as those of us who work with middle management know too well. <laughs> now, jellyfish radi off, radiate off very early, and they remain pretty much the same as they did in those days. And what's astonishing about that is that they can form eyes. So the mechanism for forming eyes must have been present way back in time. doesn't necessarily have to be used all the time, but if you need to develop it, you need to use those genes and bring them together. Now, those genes, so those other proteins, may be doing something else for much of evolution. For example, the cells that we use to form a human lens are exactly the same proteins that bacteria use to deal with a short, sharp shock to stop them dying. Um, squid use a completely different form for their lenses, and so do octopuses, and they use some um, proteins that are similar to enzymes. So nature is very parsimonious. If it's got a gene that's useful, it will use it, and it will use it in many different ways, as is directed by the environment and the time that is necessary um, for it to be used. I'm sorry about this, but I have to tell you how light is converted to electricity. In my first lecture I ever gave, this is where I counted the vast majority of people falling to sleep. So I'll see if I can do, do better this time. Okay. It is a complex thing, and it does remind us of chemistry at school, which actually is a lot more fun now than it ever used to be. We have light that strikes this cell. This cell, luckily for us, is studded in its membrane with this beautiful purple pigment that's called visual purple, as we remember, described by Vili um, who was the man who went on to dissect the eyes of newly um, um, hanged criminals to see whether we could find the image on the back of their eyes that might reveal who they'd murdered. Of course, um, this takes milliseconds to decay and he had no chance, but nevertheless, this beautiful visual purple that no ophthalmologist has seen unless he's worked in a lab because it decays so quickly. Once that light strikes, the vitamin A derivative changes shape and it causes the serpentine protein to open up, revealing the active part 
of its molecule which wakes up a signaling cascade that very rapidly leads to a lot of energy coming into the cell. And this linkage with a G protein is universal. Now, some of these proteins linked to G proteins do not see sight, and they do lots of other things. It's very useful linking to a G protein. G protein can um, exaggerate a signal very, very quickly, and it's a very powerful way of doing it. So if you have a receptor that's going to, for example, meet a noxious chemical and you need to make a quick response to it, you will use a G-protein coupling for it. And sometime in the history when those metazoa and the multicellular animals came together, one of those proteins developed a mutation. And that mutation was a sticky lysine on the seventh part here, which allowed the vitamin A derivative to stick to it. And that's probably how the light receptor evolved. So light receptors are linked to G proteins, and G proteins cause a cascade which magnifies the signal many times. Now, prokaryotic, which are bacteria and ancient single-cell organisms, which do not have a nucleus, also have opsins. And originally, we were people very excited by this, because they thought, oh, that's the origin of opsins. They've been around forever, and all we had to do was to eat these things, and then we had automatically an eye that was present. And Unfortunately, there is no homology between prokaryotic opsins and nucleated cells opsins. There's not even related by chance. They are not related, which is um, sort of a shame. And then some clever scientists scrubbed their back of their necks, and then they came up and said, do you know, it's so important to react to light that, of course, this could evolve separately. And we could co-opt a serpentine protein if we were a bacterium to respond to light, because responding to light for bacterium is also very, very important as well. And they need it for bacterial photosynthesis, for the phototaxis, the movement towards light, and also in sensory rhodopsins, inhaler bacteria, which we'll, we'll talk about presently. In celled animals, different types of, of this photopigment develop, and they're fundamentally different, and they're so fundamentally different that they get packaged in two different types of cells, which I'm going to tell you about right now because they're going to come up as the lecture goes on. One of them is on a finger-like stalk that sticks out, and that finger has a little ruffled border to it all the way around, and the reason it does that is to increase its surface area, and this is studied with this molecule here that I've shown you, which is this up and down seven transmembrane, serpentine, meaning like a snake protein. Now in ciliary photoreceptors, it's linked to the G protein, which then activates PDE, which leads to cyclic GMP. Now, rhabdomeric photoreceptors look like Bart Simpson's head. And he's got this brush haircut here. Uh, and they're linked through a different G protein to a different enzyme, and they respond in a slightly different way. Now, what turns out to be really, really interesting is that there's another um, bunch of cells in the human eye which were not recognized as photoreceptors called ganglion cells. And it turns out that ganglion cells also use this mechanism. And we'll come on to this fundamental difference in just a moment. Here is a living fossil, which will illustrate what I've been talking about for the last 34 minutes. Platinarius is a marine annelid, or a ragworm. In its larval state, it has two very, very simple structures which see light. And it has a photoreceptor cell and a pigment cell. And this reacts to light, and it sends it down a neural mechanism down to these ciliated, these hairy cells, that then start to beat. And if you stimulate it on this side, these beat, and it moves, and it can change direction according to the light, which is really rather cool. This is probably one of the simplest eyes that you could imagine, and it represents those very early stages that scientists imagined must have existed in the evolution of eyes. Now, the adult eye is also interesting. It's got another pair of eyes here. It's also got a pair of eyes deep in its brain. And in its brain, it has this ciliary, it has this ceopsin. So the story was, was that animals with backbones use ciliary opsins to see with, and animals without backbones, invertebrates, use ciliary opsins in their brain, which 
is important for light and day and circadian rhythms, but use rhabdomeric or auropsins to see with in their eyes. So there's a fundamental difference between eyes in these two great animal um, kingdoms. And then somebody found rhabdomeric receptors in the human, which are those ganglion cells that I told you about. And they have the function of circadian rhythms. So way back, before we evolved into protosomes and deuterostomes, the very fundamental difference which was going to lead on to insects, arthropods, mollusks and all of those creatures and fish and us, both of these photoreceptor types must have existed. And I'll show you that on a diagram. And what happens is, is that they're in the brain, in the developing vertebrate, and we use the ciliary receptors for seeing and for circadian rhythms in our retinas, because our retinas come from our brains. It turns out that insects and other animals like this use the ciliary receptors in their brains, and they stay in their brains, and the rhabdomeric receptors are in the eyes for vision. There's a little bit of variation on that. So, I'll just put it here. These are the two different types, ciliary and rhabdomeric, and they're here. Now, what's interesting is they're not, they don't go into sponges, so they're after sponges, and over here, the jellyfish evolve their own one. There's a little branch where the ciliary receptor is slightly different when it goes into jellyfish. But they still have a ciliary type of receptor that they actually use, those jellyfish that have eyes, and those jellyfish that have sophisticated camera eyes, particularly the box jellyfish, do use this. And then this passes on and is used, and here is the big split when we go into protosomes. They're going to use this for vision, and we're going to use this for vision. And we're going to use that for daily rhythms, and they're going to use that for daily rhythms. Quite a switch over. So how does this all fit into the panoply of how long things have been on Earth? Well, if this section at the top is the life of the Earth, and one year is a millimetre, that line would be 4,600 kilometres long. So it's, the Earth is very, 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 very old. Dinosaurs would have been about 160 kilometres on it, and humans would have been about 10 metres, and that dot even there is a bit rather large. You may have heard of some of these words, the Hedean, the Archean, the Proterozoic and the Phanerozoic era. We live in the Phanerozoic era now. The Proterozoic is the uh, one immediately preceding ours, where life, as we know it, and multicellular life started. The Archean is the ancient times, and there is even evidence, the first evidence of life in this period, and the Hadean was that hot birth. If we draw it as a clock, we can actually have a look, and we can see the last little bit here is a very, very, very short time period indeed. And I'll refer to that as we go along. So knowing how old the Earth was is a relatively new thing, and um, the explanation of fossils and various other things and the diversity of animals on life was that just there's a lot of animals. Animals were God's way of keeping meat fresh. And in the days before fridge, it sounds quite plausible. And then a Danish Catholic bishop, Nicholas Sterno, compares the teeth of a shark head with a fossil tooth and starts to work out that there may be animals that are extinct that actually didn't get onto the boat and survive the flood. And Robert Hooke, a former Gresham professor here, had also argued that, and there's a famous picture of him with his ammonite, um, which was not taken in life because there were no pictures. Newton destroyed the last remaining image of Hooke, it is believed. James Hutton was a very important geologist, and this is called a Hutton disconformity. And what it points out is that the processes of Earth that have previously gone on are ongoing today, but unimaginably slow time periods, and that this must have been deposited on this much later in time, and furthermore, this must have been flat and has been pushed up under the Earth to have the next layers deposited on top. He also, amazingly, produces a theory of artificial selection. And Smith, who drew the famous map, which enabled us to understand the <coughs> geology of England and collected various fossils, and this map is pretty similar to what is used today. So I'm going to explain some of the terms. Most of them were developed by British geologists who dominated this field. So Cambrian, the Cambrian period, that was named a classical name for Wales, where they were studying. Darwin was actually taken to Wales to study Cambrian rocks. Ordovician and Silurian um, are names of Welsh tribes. Devonian stands for itself. They found these down in Devon. And um, Carboniferous, that's an adaptation of the coal measures. 
carbon. Permian. This was defined from strata and perm in Russia by the Scottish geologist Murchison. Now, there were a couple of foreigners who got in on the act. The Triassic was described by Friedrich von Alberti and the Jurassic by Alexandre Brunyard in a marine limestone in the Jura Mountains. It was called Triassic because it has three colours. You can see the red, the white, the black, the red, the white, the black, the red, the white, the black, repeating. So that's how it got its word, Triassic. Now, this is this Hadean era when the Earth is born in this appalling heat and um, unimaginable bombardments. One of these bombardments indirectly led to the formation of the moon. Um, it, this is not a place for life. But after a billion or so years, things start to cool down a bit and some of this bombardment has brought onto the Earth water, which eventually condenses out and forms oceans. And in these oceans, eventually life forms. Possibly from RNA, forming ribosomes, which are little mini nanotechnical machines. And some of these will form these stromatolites, and they still exist today. Here are stromatolites in existence in, in Australia. Some of these bacteria form these large. This is a road, and this is a bus on the road. And these are very large mats of single cell organisms. So if we want to imagine what this Archean period might have looked like, we can pop over to America and see these boiling lakes and take a picture from a helicopter. And that's what it might, and then furthermore, we can see them here in very ancient stones, this evidence of ancient life. And some of these bacteria are with us today. For example, halobacteria live in very salty conditions. We've also have them in all of our guts. The methanogens are related to these ancient um, single-cell organisms, and there are two types of them. There's bacteria and there is archaea. And this is the beginning of vision, if you like. I mean, we wouldn't call it vision, but what it is, is to use the sun's energy to change a behaviour. And what it does is it goes through a bacteria rhodopsin, and it turns on an engine, and the engine moves, and the bacterium comes towards the light. When there's too much light, remember ultraviolet light is very dangerous, and this is a period where there is a lot of ultraviolet light around, they then need to go out, and they go down again into the shade when the motor switches over. Now, these animals are very, these, uh, these organisms are very successful, but they have a waste product, and that waste product is called oxygen, which is extremely toxic to them and to us as well. It's bound with iron. There's a lot of ferrous iron in the sea, and it's bound to iron for millions of years. And we can see this in these ancient stones, which are basically stones of rust. But eventually, the iron runs out, and then oxygen starts to build up in the sea and then into the atmosphere. And there's a mass extinction, and countless numbers of these organisms cease to exist. But another organism arises which has a cell membrane and accumulates organs in it, including a nucleus, which is self-replicating. And it may have arisen by a simple process, by engulfment of other organisms. And Lynn Margulis actually um, took up the theory of Konstantin Merechowski. And although she was considered mad in her lifetime and was extremely unpopular, it's turned out that she was probably right. The advantage of a eukaryote is, is they love oxygen, and once oxygen develops, they can thrive. Now, there are lots of eukaryotes around. Um, Henry von Heichel suggested that we use the term for these single-cell eukaryotes as protists. Multicellular eukaryotes are going to go on where multicellular eukaryotes. But the single-cell ones are still with us. They're all around. They're algae, water moles, slime nets. They, they cause diseases. They both are potatoes, which subsequently can lead to diseases of humans, like starvation and they cause um, a number of other fairly horrible things that can go wrong from you know, diseases in the eyes to the body generally. A long time ago, looking down his microscope, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek saw these little animalcules and sends a letter to the Royal Society. And what's interesting about them is, is they have a little stigmata, a little spot, that responds to light and can change their behaviour. Now, the hypothesis may be that this flagellum becomes the cilium of a ciliated photoreceptor that's engulfed by organisms and can go on and form a ciliated cell um, in, for example, a jellyfish. This is a very important organism here, which causes these dinoflagellates, 
and they have quite sophisticated ways, some of them, of blooming. We know them because they cause toxic red tides, of course. <clears throat> it's a predator, um, but it's also ototrophic. When there's lots of light, it can be photosynthetic. When there isn't any light around, it gets motoring around and it eats other organisms. And what's extraordinary is some of these things have what's called an ocelloid. This is a single cell, but part of that cell has a focusing mechanism, a pigment protective layer, and a little bundle of photoreceptive cells here. So already a focusing mechanism. So this thing can sit on the bottom of the pond, and if it sees a little thing flying around above it, it can zip up and eat it for breakfast. Now, Lynn Margulis proposes that these may have actually been the source of the very first eyes in the very first organisms, of which we have very little to go by, because the Edia and Biota, all of these animals were soft-shelled. But there are some impressions of these soft-shelled animals here. Um, we don't exactly know what they were. They may well have been parazoans, meaning they were like sponges or periphera. They're not necessarily related to um, more complex animals, but there's suggestions that some of these may have had legs and may have moved and may have been the early representatives of jellyfish and cone jellies. There's probably representatives of molluscus, kimberella, um, and various other, even arthropods. And here is Kimberella, and this is a reconstruction by Nobu Tamura of what it might have looked like. Here is the fossil imprint of it. So if mussels were in existence there, i.e. mollusks, could we see, well, chitons are a very ancient form of mollusk around, and some of these chitons actually have eyes. We can see these eyes in the shell. And what they use for these is aragonite, a crystal, to actually use as a focusing mechanism. They don't use proteins and they don't use calcite, which other animals use to form lenses. They use aragonite. And they can form a pretty sophisticated image and they've got an imaging. Um, and actually, someone's actually done visual tests on these. And I'll talk about testing chitin eyes to see what they can see when I talk about animal eyes um, next year. Well, they can differentiate between light and day. They can differentiate between predators. And the resolution of these eyes is about 20 times what the image of the moon would be on our own retinas. The Paleozoic era arises as the end of the early life forms. And the sea starts to warm up and it breaks up the continents. And we get an explosion of life, which is called the Cambrian Explosion. And in the seas, there are no animals on Earth, but in the seas, multiple different plans for different types of animals suddenly come to the fore. We've got different types of worms. We have the trilobites, and these are tremendously successful and last throughout the whole of this era until they finally become extinct along with nearly everything else in the Permian, which is the largest mass extinction that the Earth is going to see. Some of these animals, unfortunately, are no longer with us. Look at this critter here. Look how many eyes it's got. You know, I bet you that would be one of the tastiest lobsters you've ever had. You see, I love arthropods. Arthropods, although a lot of people think, aren't they ugly, aren't they strange? They're absolutely delicious. They're one of my favourite animals, um, from shrimps to lobster to various other things, that, um, even, even occasionally snails. Now, clearly, very complex fishing was developing here. Why? Because predators... Once you've got a predator, you've got to develop some pretty smart ways of avoiding it. The smartest way of avoiding it is to see it a long way off before it comes to you. It's better to see a predator than smell it. By the time you can smell it, it's often too late. So there's a big selectionary pressure. And also the predators themselves start to develop good eyes. So they can see their prey as well. And this is anomalocaris, which actually means very, very nasty big shrimp, essentially, or anonymal, uh, anonymous shrimp. And this is its reconstruction in the Science Museum, and it's absolutely, in the Natural History Museum, and it's absolutely appalling thing. You wouldn't really want to meet that if you were a tiny little animal burrowing around at the bottom of the sea. Now, did it really exist or not? Well, just recently, they found its eyes. And here are its eyes, which show a very complex compound eye, which must have had amazing resolution. Trilobites were one of the most successful creatures, and these were the first animals that we definitively know had eyes, because we can see their eyes on them here, and here's a close-up. And this is the first simple type of eye they developed, which is called a holocrawl eye. It has a single 
skin over the surface of it, analogous to a cornea. And the reason this is, there's one of these animals that molts, so it can actually change the size um, of its eyes as well as its body. More complex eyes start to develop. And what's interesting about these is that these start to be aspherical eyes. They're starting to develop aspheric optics long before we thought about this with Hubble telescopes and developing laser refractive surgery. And in fact, long before um, we discovered um, spherical aberration in telescopes, before um, Huygens, these animals were already developing multifocal aspheric lenses, which were formed by having two different lenses glued together. Now, there was a little bit of argument saying this is not true and that you could actually do this just by different condensation of gradient of calcite crystals. But in fact, they now definitely have shown that in one of the species, at least, Damanitina, that there is definitely a doublet lens, which is astonishing because they've discovered this, you know, several hundred million years before humans did, which is really one of those extraordinary things when we think about how clever humans are. We realise how much clever biology is. None of these survived the extinction, and they're not going to be used again. So evolution itself tries things out, and it can come to a dead end. Maybe one day there'll be a marine animal like a trilobite that may need aspheric vision, and it will develop aspheric vision. It will probably use very much the same materials that were around then as are around now to do that. Now, why not a chromatic vision? It's because these are sea-dwelling animals, and there isn't any chromatic aberration when you've got a single light source deep down in the sea. The colours of light are taken out very, very quickly as we go down. And that's why they didn't need to evolve that, and so they didn't. Now, we're now going to miss out the top bit. Okay, These are all the creepy crawlies and horrid things. What we're going to come down now is into chordates. And if you thought that creepy crawlies and things were horrible, you're going to see the most horrible animal on Earth that's ever existed, ever, in a moment which is actually related a bit to us, unfortunately. Now, the chordates. Chordates are things with a cord, at least at some part of their evolution. Now, not all of these are going to look like animals. Some of them actually look like vegetables, uh, the tunicates, for example. But they are little chordates, and tunicates are little tadpoles when they start, and then they go on and form these beautiful um, static um, filter-feeding tubes uh, in their adult life form. These are the cephalochordates, and interestingly, they have a prototype eye, which has the structures that are going to be used as we develop later on. Now, this is simply the most disgusting creature there's ever been invented, ever, called the hagfish. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't have a jaw, but it does have a round mouth of suckers, and it goes onto the outside of its prey, which it burrows into and eats it from the inside out. To stop itself being eaten, it creates a disgusting slime. It also does carrion, and its various other habits make it very unpopular with fishermen. It actually has an eye, but the eye is, dis is underneath a piece of skin. So it is not used for sight. It's used for circadian rhythms. So behaviorally, it's almost blind. It's got a rudimentary retina, but only two cells, and these cells project um, to the hypothalamus, a very basal, important part of the brain. Now, chordates develop. They're a bit more sophisticated animals. And this animal, resembling an eel, had two rather large eyes at the front. Large eyes imply two things. Either you lived in a dark environment or you're moving pretty fast. And it seems that rather faster-moving animals were developing here, developing fish-like characteristics. Now, lampreys are very important because these are the oldest group of animals that have eyes similar to our own. I suppose they're important to us if we're looking at it from an anthropomorphic point of view, if we're looking at how our eye might have evolved. They're very ancient, they're jawless as well, and here's their mouth without a jaw. Um, and they've got an eye very, very similar to us, and they've got four types of opsins, um, and these evolved before the separation um, here. So at this period here, we know that we have a sophisticated opsin light gathering biochemical mechanism. Um, Henry I of England died actually of eating too many of these. These are also delicious and uh, he had a surfeit of lampreys and um, Lucinius Crassus actually kept one as a pet 
Um, and when it died, he cried. And Gnaeus Domitius called him a hypocrite because actually these were very, very expensive luxury items. And he responds to this criticism saying, did you not weep? I wept for the death of my lamprey. Yes, I did. But did you not weep for any of your three wives? Um, it may not, unfortunately, have been lamprey because along with the emperors who also kept pet lampreys, they used to allegedly decorate them with earrings, which would suggest that they were actually eels, not lampreys, which don't have any lateral dorsal fins to hang um, earrings off, which is a rather sad way to end this slide as I move on to the next one. And we'll talk about shelly animals developing, these warm seas. And there's a little band right at the end in the Ordovician period where there's lots of shells. And shelly things do have lots of eyes. These are clam's eyes, rather beautiful things, rather clever things. They're reflective. And what happens with reflective is that you can actually gather a lot more light and focus it than you can if you're just using a direct uh, ray of light. And the old nautilus. Here's an old fossil still around using the simple camera eye. That's all it needs. It's rather slow moving. It doesn't need to have the sophisticated vision that this clam needs to shut itself down at the first onset of the sight of a predator. This era slowly comes to an end, but just before the Silurian extinction, the second largest of the five major extinctions, where 60% of all these marine species are gonna die off, um, we develop the early fish. At this time, critters crawl out of the sea and start to colonize the land, which for the first time has something on it for them to eat, which are these large algal mats. And we develop insects. And this movement requires the development of eyes. Here's a rather simple eye, and these animals have rather more sophisticated compound eyes, which I showed you before. And at the very final period, here are these rather bony fish. These were some of the most voracious predators that we could imagine. They would snap a shark in half. A shark would easily fit into that drawer and be chomped up into nice small bits. We come on to the Devonian period, which is the age of fish. And this is when we start to really see the development of eyes that are going to go on to form the land vertebrate eye and very sophisticated amount of receptors. The next slide I'm going to show you is a rather complicated one, but what it actually shows is how these genes, which I've shown in the light blue boxes, duplicate. And it turns out that bony fishes have a lot more receptors for different wavelengths of light than we do, as ours die out and we lose them because we became nocturnal animals to stop dinosaurs eating us. So we didn't need all of this mechanism around, and if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's exactly what happened. And then we reduplicated it again as um, old world monkeys to develop a medium wave for green, if you like, whereas the new world monkeys that we'll discuss later didn't, and so they are colour deficient compared to us. Now animals, particularly insects, take to the air, and when you take to the air you move fast, and you need very sophisticated vision. This is how big these things would be. They are absolutely enormous. Insects take advantage of this because there's a lot of oxygen around. The oxygen level starts to come down and insects never regain this size again, even though oxygen levels subsequently do. And the reason they never go to this size again is they get a competitor and a predator called a bird. And if you've got birds around and predators around, you don't want to be this size because you're going to make a lovely lunch for a whole family. You want to be as small and inconspicuous as possible. Our ancestors come out after this massive extinction when 96% of animals die, 95% of species go. And this is an early sort of um, prototype mammal that's coming through this period and bringing forward this visual witness into the future. We've mentioned how the fish are also um, developing, but as well as fish, reptiles start to expand. And we have this beautiful Jurassic animals with their bony scales around their eyes, which enables to reconstruct how big they are, the size of footballs or beach balls, these eyes, rather enormous. Why? You'll see that when we discuss uh, the giant octopus, the giant squid's eyes in a subsequent lecture, but it's to enable them to see scattering of photobiolescence, bioluminance, to escape predators. 
And then birds, which we mentioned before, which develop a very, very sophisticated imaging system and actually have vision six to eight times better than humans in the predator raptor birds. So in summary, I think I've shown you that as well as imagining that many, many, many different types of eyes could have evolved um, or could have been made by a watchmaker, it's also plausible, and more evidence is arising, that they could have also evolved by a series of small, minute steps, as imagined by Darwin. We know that these genes are present in ancient life forms, and we know that these genes have been radiated out to their descendants to this day. For example, the ancestral pattern that we saw in Platinarius in its form, uh, both in the larvae and in the adults. And the evolutionary line that leads to vertebrates, we use both of these types of receptors that have developed here and we put them into our eyes. So there may have been a common ancestor of all multicellular animal eyes and I think that the more work that comes out, the more that we see that there's an ancestral, ancestral toolkit for assembling what is needed, we can imagine how eyes might develop and be evolved. So there is evidence of evolution, that's not necessarily evidence for the absence of God um, in this process and it does remain a very controversial topic and I'm aware of that but it should still not stop people searching to see and to find how this beautiful and wonderful organ that we take for granted was assembled and how it may have evolved over 3.6 billion years. Thank you.